is I'm, that, I'm there, man. Is that a... What I'm, is this? I'm, I'm a mature adult now, but anyway. You got a couple of them, Junior? Uh, Junior, we're, we're you're ready to go home, huh? That, uh, like, for example, the, I used to... Every day, man, I'd, I'd walk in the farmer's market from my house, beat. stop for two cups of coffee at this, at this coffee bar, just drink it, yeah. and I would walk mm -hmm. home jet propelled. Yeah, yeah. Don't play, man. You never and dealt. You can't tell them when they're going to go in there. They'll sit there and turn them. Some of them are going to midnight. That kind of you know, shit, not, bro. You don't have to. Not so much right? of a <laughs> pain. It's just, what is this? But Doug, knowing Doug, he wants to get out of there. You got the beginnings of an ulcer. You got the suggestion of an ulcer. Rap, 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 rap. I went and had some coffee and went right there. I said, okay, that's it. And it's not caffeine, because tea doesn't bother me. I've been, I, I quit doing, it on off lately. I sure can't see nobody out there, but the Christmas the lights on. You know, I was just getting so tensed up. And I'm rolling. getting a little bit evangelical about this coffee thing, because. Uh, what are we doing rolling? We're rolling. Welcome out. to Austin, people. Now, it's the drug of this convention, is caffeine. It? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, hey, forget Coke, forget pot. Booze. They ain't got caffeine. none of that around here. Uh, caffeine, that's it. But I found, that's terrible. But, but it's good caffeine. It's some, it's uncut. <laughs> it blew the breaker. So uh, it's uh, it's the new sobriety. Huh? Right, everybody got remain it. calm. The dogs got <laughs> it. Ooh, it don't like it. It gets to you. I mean, you see Bob lately? Starting on this one. Okay, you let me know when we're rolling. We're rolling, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Art Fine. Little Arts Poker Party coming here from Austin, Texas, yeah. from uh, Tim's backyard. Beautiful day in March. <laughs> got the lights on, got the neighbors talking. We had a dog fight already. Got barbecue over there and some real swell Texas guests. Uh, first time in ever. Got Joe Nick Petoskey. And it's a, a belated uh, uh, greetings to you, man. I've been uh, mm -hmm. a poker party fan fan since way back when. Well, you got your own show on Access, don't you, once in a while? Well, once in a while. Actually, we're in reruns now. To, to, it's <laughs> kind of like the budget. <laughs> Is it like Father Knows Best, that <laughs> kind of thing? Well, it's, uh, it's... You're a father, aren't you? Yeah, and uh, I think I do know best, but uh, we don't try to put our trip down on anybody that comes and visits. I appreciate that. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, Austin Public Access, you run stuff once in a while? Once in a while. Uh, we did South by Southwest, Bill Crawford and I, for the last couple, three years. We did uh, kind of a, a talk show, kind of a Carson thing with a little Letterman edge. Uh, uh -huh. Not much Arsenio. Interviewing? Definitely no Sajak. Interviewing musicians? Uh, yeah, but also other other talents. I mean, here yeah, the, the entertainers time, are just not on stage. So you're kind of a, a multifaceted guy. <laughs> I, when I first met you, you were a writer, and then you were managing Joe King Carrasco for a while, and then you were a writer again. Yeah, I'm back to writing now. I've learned my lesson. Uh, it was being a music critic. There, didn't you? <laughs> well, being a music critic, you know, you kind of think, well, shit, I know, I know better than the the rest of those bozos. And that's true. You finally, I, I put my money where my mouth is, and, oh, and had a nice run, uh -huh. uh, getting into the music business. But I, I saw too much, and I know too much. You did it's very well. Get though. back and write. Uh, you brought me back, brother man. Right. That's all you need to do. Well, you know, hey, it's the thing is, work. the thing is, you got to touch as many people as you can, and. and whether they're in show business or out of show business. So I'm much happier uh, with the writing. I'm, with the band, I where can get, I Where can I see you writing? I don't you know. Can, Texas Monthly pretty much every mm -hmm. every month. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my regular gig, and uh -huh. uh, I do other freelance as well. I've been... Uh, it's under his own name. So. I, I was on uh, <laughs> uh, on the cover of Travel and Leisure last month. Is that, like, is, that like, is that like Field and Stream? What do you mean you were on the cover? Well, they did Picture a... Picture of you? I, I wrote the story, but they also did kind of a celebrity journalist story. They they, they did a, a a photo feature of my family as we went wow. on vacation to Grand Canyon. So you know we scam uh, any way we can. I'm st I'm still I don't get many promo records, but I do take the promo trips now and then, <laughs> and uh, it's almost as good. Me, it's pretty you fabulous. Well, it's good that. to see you here oh, so in beautiful Austin. I'm glad to be here, and I, especially here on the poker party. Mm -hmm. And I'm not much of a gambling man, would, I must admit. Would you like a cigar? We can't do this in the uh, regular studio. I've heard a lot about it, and I'm ready. Uh, okay, I'll take one, Daddy. Ready to fire one up. All right, we got some more great people to introduce. We'll take it to the far left now. Introduce <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Jim Dickinson. Jim, welcome to the show. Yeah, Jim Boo. Yeah. Nice, nice to see you, man. Uh, Jim, legendary, yeah, I guess so, legendary producer. Semi-legendary. Musician. Semi you are among legends here tonight. Yeah, compared to you, I'm only semi-legendary. Man about oh. town. I'm but just you're fatter not, than you, Ernest. So. But you're, you're visiting. You're not from uh, Austin. No, no, no. I'm from Mississippi. You, it's kind of the gateway to the Delta, Hernando, Mississippi, down well, you made south your, of Memphis. You made your mark in Memphis, yeah. and, uh, and you're still doing that. Hither and young. Yeah. 
Okay, next to him we got Mr. Huey P. Mo. That's it. How you doing, my boy? How you doing, man? Nice to see you in Austin, brother. I'm gonna tell you, I didn't think he was gonna make it. <laughs> nice to see you too. <laughs> you know, uh, what, what, where you living now? You're not, you're not in Austin, in Houston, fella. Texas. Didn't I hear you having a radio show in Austin for a while? Yeah, I did. Me and Joe Nick used to do stuff at KUT here. And Austin had a good time too, man. We had made a lot of noise. Well, <laughs> raised know. a lot of money, as I right. recall. That's one reason old KUT stereo is. Uh, you had, you had threatened that he wouldn't go home until they coughed up the money. <laughs> and right? They come with it, yeah. That's, that's right. it. Well, I don't know if secondary. Some, uh, some people got to put them up against the wall, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if secondary circulation counts in radio, but I used to listen to those tapes in L.A. all the time. My friends and I, we circulate them around because we you love know, you on the radio. I thank you much. I miss them times. I basically started putting some of them out on cassette just for my friends. Well, I think <laughs> yeah. that'd be great. I can't sell them because you know I don't think you get ever get the clearance on, on the get, on the records. Huey was uh, uh, of the old school of disc jockey, shouting and screaming. I mean, if you ever saw the guy work, <laughs> he wasn't paying any attention except to the music with his hands over the, uh, the headphones and stamping his feet. That's all you'd hear in the studio. Wow, wow. Yeah. Well, you have to feel what you're doing, you know. It's like making love to your favorite lover. You gotta put it all in there, you know. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Don't hold back. <laughs> Get That's everything it. you got. Well, Huey, your uh, record producing career is the, your main your main thing, and you uh, you started out. You didn't start out in Houston, did you? you no, know, I started in a little town called Winnie, Texas. Winnie? Yeah. It's next to uh, Port Arthur and Beaumont. Ross, capital of Texas. Yeah. And what were you doing there? I was cutting hair, man, and I was hustling on the side and uh -huh. <laughs> make a living. I made more money playing shuffleboard when they first came out in the <laughs> pool hall next door than I did cutting hair. But I loved cutting hair. So yeah. what kind I of never did do anything I didn't like to do. What uh, What were the first records you put out? I mean, did, did, did Little Little Doug, Little Sir Doug? Let's see. Well, it was before I, mean, I did some stuff. Uh, first record, but I was jiving jeans, breaking up's hard to do. That's the first record you put out. Yeah, I was a million seven. Then after I know that, that came was, out which was going forever, right? Rod, Rod Bernard. Bernard. Rod Bernard. Then what? Joe Bear, I'm a fool to cow. And then went on with that. Now, this should go on forever, but Jive and Gene, that was uh, out on Mercury Nationwide. Did you put it out on a local label yeah, on first? Gin Records, me and Floyd was in business together. Mm -hmm. That's you and who? Floyd, Swallow. Mm -hmm. That was Gin, was labeled together? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when did you make <clears throat> when did you make the move out of Winnie? Well, I, the, uh, when I got my first check from, uh, I never made over $75 a week, and I was old poor ass Cajun boy, and, and Cajun boys wasn't supposed to make over seventy-five dollars a week. <laughs> and uh, I got a check for forty-eight grand one time <laughs> off of Barbara Lynn, and I went and put it in the bank, local bank, and it, it everything tilted, man. <laughs> All the rich guys' wives were running the the bank, and the next day I had the narcotics bureau at the house and turned red <laughs> me. Shit, I didn't want to make no more money. It's the first time I'd have made the money. And, and my dad and all of my family together never seen that kind of money. So I figured I'd better move out of Winnie and go to the big city, man. <laughs> Got too hot there for me. What, what, uh, what Barbara Lynn record was that? Called If You Lose Me, Lose a Good Thing, which we just had in two or three movies. It's been doing oh, so, you're, so you're licensing it out now. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's a great song. Uh, so you produced that for. I was on Jamie, Jamie records, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, Jamie. That's where I first met Phil Spector and, and uh, Joey Wizard. You know, you know what he's a producer of what went by. I don't know what he's doing now. Joe Wizard? Yeah. He's in Australia now. Really? He That's was, the last he time was a little kid. I used to come up to uh, Philadelphia and bring my product, and him and Phil Spector used to sit up in a room with recording this way till I come in there because they wanted to hear my stuff. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, people want to hear your stuff now, too. Are you, are you yeah. producing again? Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm a, <clears throat> you know, I'm crazy. I, I just uh, produce records. I go make me some money, and then I go have a good time. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm running low on money, I start producing again. That's real simple, you know. <laughs> I just got two or three new acts. I'm very excited about that. I, that I think I've got some hits on. What, what, what One name rocker, and one group out of Louisiana, boy by the name of Frankie Straza. Straza? Yeah, and then I got two uh, country acts, uh, two good looking boys, 19 and 20. Because the uh, guys from, from Warner Brothers, our friends over there, said, You ain't gonna find me somebody that's young and pretty and can sing. I said, You got it. The boy, it was hard to find him. Because most of the young, young guys have a tendency to copy some of the old guys in their singing. Uh -huh. it, it's hard to find a style, you know. Uh, you, ha you almost have to take them and style them and paint them the color you want nowadays. Because most of the guys you'll notice that are 
uh, are your big singers right now, all guys that's up in age, you know, they have to uh -huh. make dragging on down, and they're up in age, but they're, you know, raising some new guys, and which is great, but it's very hard to find somebody that has unique voices. <clears throat> I find that out. I'm sure you run into that too, Jim. Oh, yes. You find 90 people a day that sings like everybody else, mm -hmm. but somebody that can sing like himself, like the last guy did was Freddie Fender, mm. and then the Tutu guy worked with that, but they sound, <laughs> you know, like themselves, yeah. It's great. Oh, by yeah. the way, Freddie Fender, now you put out when, before the next teardrop falls. Yeah, and waste. I did all the Freddie stuff. And waste the days. And I waste managed the night. him, uh, uh, washed his hair, uh, uh, you know, everything you had to do to keep an artist. You know, in the dark, <laughs> so that he would shine when you took him out. <laughs> and that's the way it was. He's a great person. He's a great act. Uh, I enjoyed working with Freddie. And like many great stars, uh, you know, a lot of problems crop up, but that's just part of the, the multiple talents that one has. Well, actually, that was your second big Mexican act. Your first big one was Sir Doug. Oh, no, he was English. Sonny. He was English, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, Sonny and Sonny. Oh, no, no. Uh, that's a joke. Talk it it, it didn't work. Uh, Sonny, uh, Sonny and the Sunliners talked to me on yeah. Teardrop Records. That was one of yours, too. Huh? Yeah, Teardrop's of mine mm -hmm, with Freddie Fender. Le you leasing that one out? Is that one of yours now? No, it's not mine. It's the MCA's. Uh -huh. Yeah, but, uh, I, you know, uh, you, you know what, what happens? They, they lease them out, then you got to go sue them to get your money. You know how that is, man. <laughs> well, you got to take your money to go get your money. And that's, that's, but that's the way it is. <laughs> And well, pay a lawyer at the same time. Yeah, but well, what about the American way? What about Doug Sam, who's playing tonight at Antone's? Uh, Doug you, Sam is like my son. And you recorded him before he was Sir Doug, when he was Little Doug. Yeah. Or little was that what it no, was? No, we Doug? gave him the Sir Doug name. Uh -huh. Yeah, he had recorded before before. Oh, me. I see. Yeah, and he recorded for who was in San Antonio? Some, uh, that, who is it in Seguin? Charlie uh, Fitch. That's yeah. who he did, Little Doug. Is that who he did Little Doug? Yeah, well, I didn't even know that. Learning something here tonight, too, bro. <laughs> Doug Sum is one of the most talented guys you've ever seen in your life. He, he, he's kind of like a Gerald D. Lewis in his own style. Yeah. When he gets through doing the show, you don't want to really follow him. Same. If you're going to be the next act, you can forget about it. Cause Doug, when, Doug, there's a difference between the act and the story. And to me, but Doug's a story like Freddie Fender was. They, they, they come alive when, when the lights come on and the people give him a big hand. They come alive. They can be wore out and tired, but when they're on, they're on. And, and uh, when they get through with the, with the crowd, they, uh, you better well take your shit and go home because it ain't going to work. But I tell you, like, <laughs> like it is. Well, speaking <laughs> of uh, crowd pleasers that you've worked with, you also produced one Jerry Lee album, didn't you? Yeah, two Jerry Lee albums. There's two or three in the can. Is that right? Yeah. From mm -hmm. when? From the Memphis session. Yeah. That's the only version of Meat Man that I know, isn't it? On record? Yeah, and that I'm was aware a, of. Mike Vicker wrote that. We <laughs> was a little earlier with that. Probably hit the day. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a rap record today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we are uh, doing the killer. Doing the killer. I'm sure you have too. Have you did him? No. Uh -uh. That was my next. Doing version. the killer is, is uh, like going to circus every day. <laughs> <you know? laughs> <laughs> but I thoroughly enjoyed. I got. I got to admit, he and I got along. We fought in Oregon and everything else, but it was worth the trip. You know, he's he's a. He's a, uh, uh, Gerald Lee Lewis is, is probably the reason why they invented the word rebel, man, is kind of him. <laughs> and he's, uh, he's going to be Gerald Lee till he dies. You know, you, you gotta, it's like George Jones, you know, for years, even Gerald Lee, the people would not accept him if you was, uh, screwing your cousin or whoever you were, you were screwing, <laughs> they'd, they'd put you down, you'd fall off the charts, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, nowadays, uh, um, you know, they've learned in the last 10, 15 years, people have learned how to separate men's personalities from their talents and enjoy their talents that they give you, which is the greatest thing that ever happened because guys like George Jones have been gone a long time ago and he's like my brother. But uh, I'm so glad that the people have learned to leave uh, people's bedroom tales to themselves and, and go ahead and enjoy the music that they're putting out. But I thought that, that never was going to happen. Yeah, the yeah. days when when Jerry was shot at and shot down, like the man said, it was just uh, too early in age. Mm -hmm. Today they wouldn't pay no mind to it, you know. Well, let's see. That's uh, Jerry Lee's a, a Memphian, and that, that little segue us over to Jim a little bit. He Jim lives right down the street, actually. Yeah, you got Say trouble. That again? He does. He lives in Nesbitt. That's right down mm -hmm. from where I live. Right down from Hernando. Yeah. So, uh, you, but you, uh, now you've worked in, out of Memphis since what? The early '60s, late '50s. Late '50s, yeah. I had a high school band in the late '50s. That, uh, <laughs> never, we never did anything. No records. Very serious. No, no records. Uh, 
in the, well, I guess in 60, 61, I was signed to Reuben Cherry's Home of the Blues. I was the only white artist on it, and uh, wow. nothing ever came out. We cut some stuff, leased it to VJ, and VJ went bankrupt. And the, Is that right? So, like, my first record, quote-unquote, never came out. Well, that was under the name James Dixon? Yeah. Dickinson? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, we, uh, what, we know you in many contexts, uh, certainly the Dixie Flyers, yeah, I, I guess like Shoals. I, I, I kind of made it as no, we weren't from Muscle Shoals. They were the Swampers. We were from Memphis, and but we made our records, our Atlantic records, in Miami. We were the band that went uh, left Memphis and went to Miami with Wake Tommy and Dodd. Dodd yeah. Yeah. And I only stayed six months, but we did like fourteen albums in that six months. And <laughs> like what? And you were always a, a real solid backup band. For Everybody else. from Jerry Jeff to uh, Aretha, Sam and Dave. We made a record on Taj Mahal that never came out. The beginning of the end of the Dixie Flyers was we were scheduled to work with Dylan, and there was problems between uh, Wexler and Grossman, and the session was canceled, and it oh, kind of no. was downhill from there. What know. Aretha and Sam and Dave records were you on? The Sam and Dave thing didn't come out until just recently on Charlie, because uh, the Sam and Dave had one of their typical problems uh -huh. at the end of the session. And uh, with Aretha, we did Spirit in the Dark, Don't Play That Song, uh, The Thrill Is Gone, something else. A bunch of them. I've kind of lost touch with linear time. <laughs> that period. You know. can't, can't run, but so much of that thing. You right. got to give it a room to breathe. Sometime. Well, when you would go from like, well, we would cut a typical artist for five days, and then go to a, you know, another artist, and it could be as extreme as Lulu, to uh, Ooh, Carmen. What McCrow. Lulu? What Lulu? Uh, hum a song from your heart. It was a chart record. Uh huh. The I like Carmen McRae record's probably the best thing we made on Atlantic. And what, what's that one? Just a Little Lovin', it barely existed. Just a Little Lovin' early in the morning? Yeah, mm -hmm. Donnie Fritz song, right. I seen Donnie the other day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he come by, him and Chris come by the studio and see me. Stops and says hello. Well, we'll take, we'll take outside advice. Sound man, are, are we not uh, hearing them? Uh, we, got, we haven't got the monitors on right now. Oh, so they can't hear them. Okay, well. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Y'all drawing close. I, you know, Jim. Problem in show business. Jim is a guy that I have a lot of respect for because of the many hours that guys like him put into uh, engineering, also, you know, besides producing and uh, and don't really get credit for it, you know. Well, you gotta, you know, work in the South, especially in that period of time. You had to do it all, or you, yeah, well, that's or, or right. get a day job. Know, and I was yeah. never smart enough for day work. <laughs> Neither me, man. I never liked nothing I had to get dirty at. <laughs> well, Jim, I mean, you've been a prolific <laughs> producer as well as a piano player and guitarist, right? I've been through periods of production. I, I kind of, yeah. I do owe this to Joe Nick, getting back into it, uh, yeah. strictly doing the groups I've been well, doing you, recently. I mean, you've been uh, active in the 80s. You did the replacements, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Was that a lot of fun? Pleased to meet you. Actually, it was, was kind of long, but it was fun. Uh, but it wasn't. I didn't try to beat them up and make them into something that they weren't, like others who can remain nameless uh -huh. uh, did. But uh, yeah, I had fun with the replacements. And you work a lot with Ry Cooter, don't you? Yeah, I did. I did. Hadn't uh, worked with him recently. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> What's that it about? Happens he just like hadn't been working with him recently. <laughs> hadn't been working on stage. <laughs> well, what? I mean, Ry, if you're watching out here in LA, give him a call. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. he'll tell you what. <laughs> well, also, now you were on Sticky Fingers with the Rolling Stones, yeah, right? Yeah. You were playing piano. That was in Muscle Shoals, yeah. And that was in Muscle Shoals. Yeah. So, uh, any no. other albums with them? Wild Horses, no. Uh -uh. So Wild Horses, particularly, or the whole album? No, that's the, uh, that's me playing piano on, on Wild Horses. That's that's all of the album. Were you on tour? You uh, you show up in there in, in photos of the Stones. You pop up now and then, like in the yeah, well, Gimme Shelter movie. You're in. That was the that was the Wild Horses session uh, in Gimme Shelter. Actually, uh -huh. I'm the guy who looks like he came in to change the tire. <laughs> <laughs> he probably <laughs> just got through changing one. <laughs> no, actually, what it, I got in a shot because I saw him setting the lights up. You know, I've been to drama school. I knew what the lights were for. So I sat down on the couch. It was the end of the session, and I had the last joint. And Keith, <laughs> and Keith knew it, so he, he's a smart man, you know, he walked over, sat down, they turned on the lights, they played the tape, and I'm in the movie, you know. That's it. I went, to, I went to drama school at Baylor, 100 miles from here, I learned important shit like that, you know, yeah, how to sit in the it. lights. So you haven't actually used your drama training for nothing? Yeah, I use it every day. Every day. <laughs> every day. You have to, you yeah. have to him, brother. Joe Nick and I were talking about that earlier. I owe Paul Baker more than he'll ever know. You know, uh, I was looking at an article about you that my friend Kent Benjamin had, and it was saying that you also were, had something to do with Black Oak. 
Oh yeah, oh, Jim yeah. Dandy. I remember oh, yeah. that. I, remember I cut that. black oak before they were black oak when they were nobody else. When they were good, actually. Th wait, they yeah, were nobody right. else. That was their name, or that yeah. they were nobody else. Yeah, they were nobody else. K N O W. Yeah. yeah. Oh, K N O W. Yeah. Okay. They so were that, incredible. They turned out the whole northern part of Arkansas. I mean, they were an amazing band. I, th and, I always thought they were great. You know, they were led in the wrong direction. Though. Yeah, I liked them too. And what about Ruby Starr? Ruby Starr, I don't know. I don't think <laughs> I never thought of her as a major talent. You know? I did. I love those she two albums. She was nasty. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of dressed like the Jolly Green Giant. She had these kind of <laughs> things on it. Yeah. And, uh, and and Daisy May, I, I liked her a lot. Yeah. Did you did you see a, a similarity between Jim Jim Mangrum and uh, David Lee Roth? Oh yeah, and I think if you woke Roth up in the middle of the night, he'd admit it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> one of the things they did, well, seriously, one of the things they did before they became Black Oak and you know and did that was they played a bunch of bar stuff. You know, they spent six, eight months in L.A. playing bars. I'll bet you he saw him. It was too close. Boy, I thought it was. When I had Mangrum, though, he, was, he had a, a long, stringy, ratty mustache, and he hadn't fixed his teeth. And see, when the guy he got his first rock and roll money, he fixed his teeth. He had these rotten, awful teeth, you know, uh -huh. that sounded great on the microphone. Oh, right? And as soon as he got his rock and roll money, he fixed his teeth, and he never sang again. I remember I was backstage with him at a show at Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City, and I was very impressed when he took his teeth out. Yeah. He's the first star that yeah. Yeah, if I, I, showed me if his If I'd have cut gums. him again, I would have got him to sing without his teeth. Hmm. What were you doing backstage with him? I, writing a story on him. Well, you were in a lot of different publications. Now you're only in Texas Monthly. Weren't you, were you in Rolling Stone much? I don't remember. I did a little bit of Rolling Stone, uh, some cream, country music. <laughs> Whoever would pay me. Now, man. He's got to stay around. And you got a poppin' and one on the way too. Right? Yeah. So I mean, I kind of stick close to Texas now. That, that's that's more than enough territory to cover. I told him that was gonna happen too. If all this coming by, you didn't believe me. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know gonna how make it goes. Oh, gonna make the tick back, brother. Now uh, we'll go back to Jim for a second. We got this uh, older 1972, I think, a Dixie Fried uh, uh, James Luther Dickinson album on uh, Atlantic. Atlantic, right? Yeah. That was uh, when I left the Dixie Flyers, see, you know, it was actually cut in, in 70. It took it a while to escape. Uh-huh. <laughs> so this thing, um, this is what, but you're basically behind the scenes. This is a rare yeah. uh, singing. Well, this appearance. is what drove him behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah. I made some records before that with Bill Justice and, and oh, one, really? one on Sun. With on Sun? Time. You made one on Sun? Yeah. Later, what? It's, it was 65. Uh, you know, it sounds earlier. Than oh, that's that. when they, they changed studio. Well, they moved to Nashville then. Didn't no, they? no, no. It was it was cut at Sam Phillips. It wasn't cut at 706. But he moved out of there in '58. Yeah. But it was cut at the, the current Phillips studio. Are so you still performing too? Cadillac. Band. James is. Yes. Uh, recording for. Are you still a New Rose recording artist? <laughs> yeah. And you yeah. have a lot in common with Austin bands yeah. here. Yeah. He's out of New Rose, out of France. Yeah. yeah. He's uh, his band Mudboy and. The Neutrons? Yeah. Oh yeah, I want to hear about that because I haven't heard new, that. Like, I got a new record coming out on New Rose. It's a compilation of my film work that I've done independent of Cooter. Uh, <laughs> several several selections from a, a skin flick and a couple of little college pieces. So wait, what are you doing? Like Love is Blue or what, what, what no, kind of stuff? No, you know, your typical uh, film score stuff. Or maybe your not so typical film. Your typical Texas mm -hmm. film score yeah. stuff. Some of it is. Some, actually, I did two of them for the University of Texas Film whatever students. People. Well, what about Mudboy and the Neutrons? This is kind of a hard rock band, so to speak. No, it's where we're the leftovers from the '60s Memphis <laughs> Country Blues Festivals. We're like the the white guys that uh, you know played the. We never played together on the festivals, and now we. Play is it together. a floating? Uh, There's four of us that are the same, and then a few that float around. So who's the four guys? Me and Lee Baker from Moloch, uh, a black a rock band that was on uh, Stax. Sid Selvich, who's like kind of a folk singer, mm -hmm. uh, who's been around for a while, and Jimmy Crossway, a percussionist, and then whoever we play with. We've well, been together, I guess, 18 years now. Well, you've stayed stable. Right. You've always been in Memphis. So what, what about during the Stax era? Was there any work for you then? That, that, uh... I myself didn't work that much at Stax. Yeah. I was uh, ch like childhood friends with Packy Axton, son of the woman who owned it, and that kind of included you out. I mean, Packy yeah. was kind of early on uh -huh. included out of everything. But the singer from my high school band made the uh, the second satellite record, which is what Stax was. Oh, Satellite, yeah. the Marquis. The late, great Charles Prove You Love Hines. Yeah, the Marquis was a band that came up just after my band in high school. Well, then we got an album you produced with <laughs> Big Star. Yeah. It's the third Big Star album called Big Star's Third. 
but certainly Alex Chilton. Now, yeah. produced by Jim Dickinson, what's your, you had a long-standing involvement with Alex Chilton, too, right? Well, I've known Alex for a long time since he was a 12-year-old kid. Yeah? And uh, we had talked about it. So I, I was a big uh, box tops fan, which Alex well, is I not, too. he's not proud of the box tops work right? at all. Yeah, and uh, so I was a real fan of that work. And yeah. uh, was we too. had talked about it several times, and uh, I don't know when he got to the point where he wanted to use a quote-unquote producer. You know, it was me. And I'm real lucky I did that. I didn't take it very seriously at the time. But it's led to most of the groups I've done since. Is that right? Uh, yeah. As this record was barely even released. I was about to say, that's not a really well-known album. Was, it was basically just bootleg twice. Is that right? And, uh, BBC. <laughs> the first time I toured Europe with Cooter, every time anybody knew enough to talk to me about something, it was that. Is that right? Yeah. You know, and you know they say about the Velvet first Velvet Underground record that everybody who bought it form, formed a band. That's got to be true of this record. Of this record yeah, itself. Yeah, because huh? I mean, I, well, you got a different Alex Chilton record, did you? That was a very different Alex Chilton. Uh, and then you're working on this one too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and uh, this one had even less distribution than the other one. Yeah, didn't it had not existed entirely. That's the real thing. That's the American release. That's hard to get. Well, oh, because it doesn't because uh, the. English one says like flies on something else? No, it doesn't have the Eggleston photograph. Oh, I see. Well, yeah. So uh, with Alex... That, music, that hung in the Museum of Modern Art, for the love of God. Is that right? For no particular reason. Well, uh, during that time with Alex Chilton, you also trucked with the Cramps, or you knew about them? Or? No, the Cramps uh, came to Memphis to cut their first record with Alex producing. And uh -huh. I did what you would now call pre-production, I guess. <laughs> we, we didn't call it that then. We were just kind of hanging out. Those records had pre-production? What, what do you mean? No, but I mean, no. They, now you would now call it pre-production. That's what the companies make you do before you get to produce. <laughs> well, did you meet those guys as a result of them coming in to work with Alex, or did you know of them beforehand? I knew of them before, but I didn't know them. Uh, Alex had a girlfriend named Lisa that much of the music is about. Who had? Uh, I'm sorry, much of the music on Flies on, on both of them, Both of them. On both the big star records. The big star record is actually supposed to be called Sister Lovers, and she was one of the sisters. The drummer was going with the other sister. I mean, that was the idea of it. But she had been a waitress at Max's Kansas City, and had first told you know everybody in Memphis about the Cramps. She was the the discoverer of the Cramps, as far as I'm concerned. Uh huh. So uh, what about? Uh, but that was the real Cramps with Brian Gregory. I mean, it was not the the Erstat commercially repackaged Cramps. Sheesh. The way he talks about the Cramps. Well, do you like the Beach Boys? They got a new guitarist in '63. Come on, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know. No, but the Cramps without Brian it's Gregory. Perspective. Yeah, I mean, the, if you're into the Cramps, the Cramps without Brian Gregory are definitely not what the Cramps with Brian Gregory were. I suppose. But but I, if you're gonna talk about it, you might as well get down to it. You've you noticed know? a loss, huh? Well, Seriously about it. <laughs> well, what about uh, in, in Memphis right now? Uh, you got any truck with the uh, Panther Burns and Tav and those guys? Yeah, yeah. We we're supposed to actually. We we're supposed to be working on a record now that hadn't quite started yet. Sometimes it takes Tav a while. That's a, it's another one of them. <laughs> another one of them new rose things, right? Yeah. He's actually got an American deal now. He's got a deal with Triple X. Stateside. Is that right? Yeah. We got another guest here. I think uh, we got a walk on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Mr. Mike Buck, the all-star drummer of Austin. Oh, all right. Now you're talking. Yeah, all right. Mike. <laughs> hey, how you doing, man? Can, 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 hey, I can't see you on the camera. Sit next. Have a seat next to Jim. Just have a seat, Mike. Next, is your wife gonna walk on? Say hello. Oh, I mean, she's she's retired from show business. I know, but I mean, there's people hello, like her. Right now, Hank. Here, maybe I should give him my mic. I mean, my camera's turned on, Hank. <laughs> okay, we gotta get get you mic. Get Mike mic. You Can Chris come on and say hello? Bring the kid on. I'd like to. Hey, you want me to give somebody my mic? No, no, we like you here. I like you. I like you right, here. If you, if you can okay. hang around. I, no, I, I, need to I just don't want to hog everything. Mike, it's your garage though, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Should be another one. Wonder whose mic that was supposed to be. The thing came up. <laughs> Disruptive there. <laughs> How you been, my man? All right? Yeah, I thought you did. Hold it. Same old thing, bro. Turning them pages and crying the other side. <laughs> you playing somewhere like that? Yeah. Well, well, let's, well, let's have you actually literally do a walk on. Yeah, that'd be fun. It's a move. These are moving pictures. Okay, okay. Oh, are we pausing here? Yeah. Mikey, what have you been doing? 
sucking up to these uh, record execs here, you know. Trying to ingratiate myself. <laughs> We're rolling, guys. How many times are you rolling? playing uh, We're rolling, this, okay. this week? Just twice. Oh. Uh, we're back on. We're going to do that in a second. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, is Chris in in near view? Somewhere on the periphery. Let's let's bring I in your. I can't see with this glare. Yeah, well, that's the way it is. Is uh, can Chris come on? Come on, Chris. Yes, and this, this bring is the reason Jake why over here. I, I left show business here. Uh, <laughs> face the camera and say hello. Uh, yeah. That's Big shot. Yeah. That's <laughs> it. Profile. That's you started in zone show uh, business. Introduce today. introduce your family. Okay, this is uh, my son Jake right over here. Uh huh. And. Uh, Jake is uh, a pianist. Is that right? He's pretty good. And uh, this is my wife, Chris, who is also a pianist. We haven't started him on the box yet. He's he's on Casio. Now, it's box because you used to be keyboard gal with Joe King Carrasco. That's right. That's where you got your world fame. World fame. <laughs> and flame. And flame. Well, you got that flame. You got him. <laughs> it's nice to see you guys. And uh, when are you uh, expecting another? I'm going to domino in April. End of April. <laughs> Domino. Domino. That was a. That's who's that by besides the cramp? Then we're going to start a family band. You know, in the old days, people used to have big families in Texas so they could have plenty of hands picking cotton. Uh huh. Well, we're doing. We're working on a band here. Just going to keep it all in house. Like the Partridge family, huh? Kind of yeah, like the what? Yeah. Partridge family. <laughs> the cow. The cow sales. With accordions. Yeah. The cow sales. Microphone. Wow, well, it's great to see you. Nice Good to, to see, see you guys. <laughs> well, I also got to introduce Mike Buck way over on the right. Uh, Mike, I got Mike Miked. And that also reminds me that this is my second buck this week. Is that uh, right? Yeah, I had Peter Buck on Saturday. Uh, oh, yeah. Had this uh, Kevin Kinney, this folk singer from Atlanta, was on the show back in L.A. And uh, he brought Pedro with. But I never met him, but I met you plenty of times. <laughs> so how you doing? Oh, doing fine. Now, you've been drummer with the Leroy Brothers forever. Yep. More, and, longer than I can care to remember. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's more, it's, more than a de it's more than a decade. Well, go almost a decade now. It's a great band. Uh, Thank you. Are you drumming with anybody else? I know you get around. Well, tonight I'm playing with uh, Doug Somm, Huey's oh, old yo. buddy, <laughs> over okay. at Anton's. What Been time is that? Any time? About 10 o'clock. I have Augie Meyer over there, too. And Augie on me? Too? Yeah, all the West Side Horns, Rocky Morales. And all right. Maybe I ought to go, man. <laughs> <laughs> Doug's actually going to have two bands. He's going to have George Raines playing with the horns, and he's going to have the quintet. Why don't you ever play yeah, in L.A.? Yes, Junior. I might go up there. What's wrong with L.A.? I think we wore out our welcome there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I've I seen you at Club Lingerie probably five years ago or something yeah. like that. Well, we have a new album out now, so maybe we can get over there. On New Road Records. Okay. Well, where do we leave talk off? Like I don't you're know. talking to Mike about Aaron? Oh, yeah, talking to Mike about L.A., okay. right. I'm going to see him tonight. Okay. L.A. Why don't you ever play in L.A.? Yes, Junior. I might go up there. What's wrong with L.A.? I think we wore out our welcome there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Man. I s I seen you at Club Lingerie probably five years ago or something yeah. like that. Well, we have a new album out now, so maybe we can get over there. On New Road Records, right? I just happened to have one right here. Oh, hey. Uh, <laughs> got one for art. It's kind of white. You can't see it too well on TV. But, yes. But uh, a new Leroy Brothers album. Chris O'Connell backing vocal. Huh. Yeah. What? Somebody say something? So, uh... This band I got tonight for the Doug show, is it specially put together? Have you been playing with him once in a while? Uh, yeah, I'll play with him from time to time. Um, we're about to do a tour of the Midwest and uh, the East Coast. Is that right? Yeah, with Augie and Doug and Speedy Sparks and uh, Rocky Morales and Louis Ortega. Huh. So should, we, we did that once before and it was really fun, so we're going to give it another whirl. Well, the Leroy's have been going all over the world too, haven't they? Yeah, we've... We, uh, we went to Australia and Europe last year, and I think this year we're going to play in France, I know for sure, and maybe right. some other European gigs. Great. So. Are you from Austin? I'm from Fort Worth originally. Yeah. Mike and I yeah. uh, Nick. used to run together back in the fort way back when. In the fort? That's right. He told me, he told me France, the first you know? low-down joint I'd ever been to, which was Mabel's Eat Shop over there in Como. Oh, hell oh, yeah. Okay. And, uh, I'm sorry, Huey, what would you say? When are you going to France, do you know? It's a, it'll be June. Like, I'll be over there. Oh, Let good. Let me know when you're going over. I'll do Is that. that? I got forgot about my standard question. Well, what's the first record you ever bought? Well, what? Uh, it might be uh, Burl Eyes, Goober Peas. Okay, what, that was it. what's the first rock record you bought? Uh, 
Boy, I'll have to think about goober that. Goober peas. I don't know that one. Is that a Decca record? Peas, 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 Dude. peas. Eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious. I think uh, my first was Ahab the Arab, maybe. Well, right here, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's either that or Monster Mash. But before that, my dad I got me. Monster Mash. Don't, don't take your guns to town, Johnny Cash. <laughs> <laughs> the well, the other, a similar question is, what was the first show you ever went to? Oh, uh, the, well, the first show was uh, Homer and Jethro. They were opening for Tommy Sands. And I was a Homer and Jethro nut. Is that right? Yeah, that was when I was well, about I like five them. or six. I did. I like them too. And then I guess the first so-called, uh, well, the first concert yeah. in the modern sense of the term uh, was Herman's Hermits yeah. at the Will Rogers Coliseum in Fort Worth. Well, who, who's on? I was there. Who was opening for Herman? I can't remember. I don't remember. Uh, I saw Herman opening for the animals in the Chicago. No, well, Herman was a headliner. I mean, you got to understand, this is Fort Worth. This wasn't a big city. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, it, it was a good show, as I recall. Yeah, I mean, then a few months after that, they had the Rolling Stones play there. Had uh, yeah. Patti LaBelle and the Blue Bells open for them. And, and the Stones came in, and uh, they had a, a theater in the round in the center of the arena. Yeah. It was real stupid. <laughs> and they had to bring them in in, a, in an armored truck. <laughs> and that was kind of neat. Armored truck? Yeah. I mean, they were in the armored truck, and the crowd was like, swarming around them as they were headed to the stage. What about you, Mike? What would be the first show you went to, rock show? The first rock and roll band I can remember seeing was I went to this hot rod show in Dallas and the, uh, the five Americans were playing there. <laughs> the band that had I See the Light. And That's, Zip Code and yeah. Western Union. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, there were a few local local rock bands <laughs> playing at the uh, bowling alley I used to hang out. Yeah. But Mike's, Mike is uh, noted for, for uh, really playing the definitive Fort Worth shuffle beat, which is, uh, has been typified by Ray Sharp's Linda Lou. And uh, he, he grew up direct. He didn't listen to the records. He just played with the cats uh, way back when. I mean, he played, he played with all the stars uh, <laughs> back in the old days. Curly Barefoot Miller, Mr. U. F. Wilson, yep. Robert right? Ely. Yeah. Wow. Well, Jim. Finney Moe. Yeah, Mr. Finney Moe. Jim, what's the first record you ever bought? Well, it's still my criterion for judgment as far as what an album is supposed to be. It was an album of 78s, uh, Tex Ritter's Children's Songs and Stories, <laughs> Cowboy Tex Ritter, a wonderful thing. <laughs> well, what about rock and roll? Did you, what's well, the first that, awakening uh, you had? What I, you know, y'all are so young that uh, you got to understand there was a world Without Before rock and roll, <laughs> and it, it was hard. You know, it's hard to get that across to, to groups that I work with. That, I mean, I remember the the first time I heard a rock and roll record when there was no such thing. You know, and wondering if I'd ever hear another one. Is that right? You yeah, know, I see what you it, mean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And then as there were then there were like three, then there were six, then there were ten, and y you looked forward to new records coming out in a very different way in the 50s. Like you knew there'd be another Chuck Berry record, and it was going to be good like the last one. And you waited for it to come out, like a magazine or something, you know. Wow. I remember the night on uh, on Red Hot and Blue when Dewey Phillips played uh, Long Tall Sally like ten times in a row because it was the new Little Richard record and everybody wanted to hear it ten times in a row. Wow. That's great. There wasn't that many to play. Yeah, it's it's hard to imagine the excitement of the 50s, rock and roll in the 50s. You know what? The, you know, remember what the first one that really caught your attention was? The first, uh, the first rocket music I ever heard, I guess, was Bill Harvey in the Harlem in Havana review. At the, the Harlem in Havana review? Yeah, at the Royal American shows, the, the fair and stuff that would come around, you know? During the Cotton Carnival, it was the first black big band Man. that I got to see. Now see, I'm not from the South. How did you get to see him? I don't know how you even get to go to the White shows. audience, all white audience. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, but it was the first place that an all white audience, you know, that kids could get in to see. Uh -huh. you know? with dancing girls and the whole thing. You know. <laughs> I remember seeing Al T&T Braggs at the Cotton Club at the State Fair in Dallas. Same and, deal, see? Yeah, it was a review. Yeah, and that, that it was, was good. They'd always sell you stuff Yeah, in between the songs, too. <laughs> well, what about you, Huey? What's the first, well, first record? He started record. selling records before he bought them. Yeah. <laughs> no, I couldn't afford to buy one. And Huey's yeah. one of the only people on earth and in the industry who's actually older than me. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember the first record I bought, man. I, I remember I liked the blues before I liked anything in, in the country. Yeah. The blues was what I really loved. So down there in Winnie, you, you call yourself a Cajun, but you're from Texas, right? We're not from Louisiana. You didn't know Canada. that? Why? Well, 
I'm down the swamps, man. Tell about this good English of mine, man. <laughs> you <laughs> get it? What, the little town I was born and raised in, man, and then further than that, you jump off in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So what, that, where, where, where was that town? What you was know, it? I'm going to tell you this. They didn't have to, they'll have to delete it. But where I come from, the mosquitoes are so big, man, they can stand flat-footed and fuck a turkey, brother. And there ain't no <laughs> doubt about it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you like it is, man. So it's down on the Gulf Coast? Yeah, I, I come from a little rice mill town called Kaplan, Louisiana. Kaplan? Right, Louisiana, wasn't right next door. But it was, a, it was a town where I used to shine shoes down there for four cents a pair. And <laughs> nine, 10, 12 years old, I was uh, washing dishes and cooking hamburgers in a joint. But, and, but you know, Winnie's a Cajun town, though, too. I mean, yeah, that part a, of Texas, East Texas, between Houston and the Sabine River. That's all Cajun. Is that right? Yeah, yeah it's about kind of 80%. Spill over mm -hmm. From Louisiana. Were you a young French speaking kid? Oh, yeah. When I, in fact, uh, I was talking, telling somebody tonight when I went to school, I couldn't speak English. And, and they used to tear our butt up because we spoke French, you know, because I didn't know. It did a number on me because I didn't know they had any other language, you uh -huh. know, because they lived in swamps. Everybody spoke French. And when they would try to tell me, I can, that's why I can understand how some of the Mexican guys go through. You know, going to school and have they won't let them speak Spanish and stuff because we thought that was the only language that was was French. You know, because that's all my mom and grandma and everybody talking. And I learned from uh, uh, the guy that my dad was working for on the, on the rice field in cotton farm. Yeah. He had a son that couldn't speak French, and uh, and his name was Baker, Jim Baker. And I learned how to speak English from him, and he learned how to speak French from me, and speaks better French than I do. Do you find that whole French isolation thing disappearing? Well, you know, I'm not a guy that ever thought of things, isolation type of thing. I've always been free-hearted, free-thinking, and I love everybody. And it's never, something that's never entered in my mind. But I mean, are, are there people down in West, East Texas, or Louisiana who don't speak English right now? Oh, yeah. I've got some of my kin folks who don't speak English. A couple yeah. of old ones, yeah. Right. They try once in a while. They, they can, you can speak to them, and they know what you're saying, you know. But for them to come out and carry on a long conversation, it's going to be half French and half English, half French and half English, you know? Well, didn't you have something to do with re reviving the career or finding Clifton Chenier back in the mid-60s? Yeah. Well, Clifton's, uh, you know, to me, you know, even though we had the two-toot record, Clifton Chenier to me was the inventor of Zadico music, period. And there there have been so many imitators, and but there's never been nobody could touch Clifton Chenier. Clifton Chenier, when he played, he, he had his own thing. He played from his heart. Uh, he played, uh, you know, that's why I don't do, uh, I can do Zadiko all day long. Everybody's doing one, so you, why don't you do it? Because uh, the guys that I hear, man, and I love them for doing it, you know, but they, they, fall, they fall so far below Clifton Chenier's field that I don't have the heart to do it. I know what you mean. And I don't know how to explain that, but you know what I'm talking about. Jim is just... Huh? I'm just having to go uh, uh, produce somebody, and I, and I think of the days that we was doing Clifton, and he sitting there with that gold tooth smiling, and, and it was so easy for him. It would just pour out. That feeling, was, it was all his, and, and to, to go try to get somebody to copy him, it, it just don't. It ain't there with me. It just falls wow. short below him. Yeah, right? you're confirming my suspicions. I don't like to hear that because. You know, since Clifton's gone, I, I mean, I think buckwheat's real good. Yeah, they, but Pretender. they're all cheap, cheap yeah, imitators of him, you know? I mean, yeah. CJ's pretty good, too. The kid's pretty good. The band really rocks. I'm a boozoo man. Boozoo, so. yeah. Boozoo, boozoo, boozoo is a good. good. I, I produced some stuff on boozoo, too, and them. I liked them. But boozoo's them, his only contemporary, though. He goes yeah. that far back, though, yeah. with the paper in my shoe. Yeah, yeah but see, Clifton, man, is, is the man. Clifton yeah, was the man, man. When it comes to feeling with an accordion, hello, partner, how you doing? <laughs> Glad you come visit us. <laughs> but anyway, Clifton, Chenier, there's nobody could do. When did you when did you cut Clifton? Under what circumstances? Were there any crazy Cajun records on Clifton? Or? Clifton. Did you cut uh, Arhuli? I get I get no. I never cut Arhuli. Come come uh, come. Got Clifton and cut him after I cut him. You know. In uh -huh. fact, he wouldn't even land in Houston for a long time because I was waiting to serve him with a lawsuit. Wait, I thought you were. <laughs> Wait, who, who are you going to serve with a lawsuit? Uh, oh, who he knows, You know who I'm talking about, Cliffs, after, right? Uh-huh. He's a good guy, man, but he had stolen my axe. I was waiting for him to come to Houston so I could remind him of it. You know? <laughs> <laughs>
So he wouldn't tell nobody when he came to Houston. It was in and out. Well, didn't Atlantic try and cut him or something like that? No, I, I had a deal. Wexler wanted, wanted Jerry that. Wexler wanted him? He wanted him. I finally sold Jerry on it, and I come back then and wanted Clifton to do an album. Uh, you know, for Jerry, we had a tour support, and by that time, Clifton got, he had him a Cadillac, an old Cadillac, and, and uh, a cigar twice as long as yours, eh? And he had a, a roll of one dollar bills with a rubber band around it, and he said, how you like my car? Good looking chick up front. That was the, that was the end of that career, man. He did not care about going, he was just happy. Clifton was doing what he was doing right where he's at. You know, kind of like a Joey Long in Houston. The guys that are very happy, T.K. Hewlett, guys that are very happy right there. And it took me years to understand that, you know. But, but a guy that's making good money and he's with his family and he's very happy playing what he likes to play and when he likes to play uh, is happier than the guy that's out there beating his brain out every night 24 hours a day. You know, he might make more money. But he won't never be as happy as this guy. This happy, this guy was smart enough to realize that that I'm doing what I love to do and still be with my friends, you know. And that's that's why uh, Doug Summer. Uh, we we can point them out all day, guys. That that could have been multi multi talented stories, but they they like to do the things they like to do when they like to do them. And, and it took me years to understand that. We got a match. But I respect him for it, you know. Well, what about uh, Doug Somm's interaction with Freddie Fender? Uh, uh, they both had out Wasted Days and Wasted Nights. Now, who wrote that one? Freddie. Freddie wrote mm -hmm. it, and Doug, did Doug have it after him or before? No, Freddie had that, that you know, uh, 15 years before. It was in the 50s, back yeah. in the, what, 58? Mm -hmm. Is that right? 59? Yeah. 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 When I cut Freddie better. Fender on Wasted Days, I almost had to kill him and make him do it. He said, I'm tired singing that song. He did right? that in 59, and then Doug did it in 69 mm -hmm. or 70. Uh-huh for the return of Doug Saldana, and that kind of brought Freddie back into the limelight. And then, then Huey brought Freddie up here, I remember the Soap Creek Saloon. And yeah, cut them together. It was kind of, it was kind of a rock thing Is back right? then. And mm -hmm. you know, no one knew Freddie except as the Elvis of the Valley. Well, what? The Elvis Presley of the Rio Grande mm -hmm. Valley. Oh, That's down Kid. in South yeah, Texas. Yeah, Bob Kid, you right. That's what they call Freddie? Yeah, and uh, those shows at Soap Creek, I thought, I mean, there was, I remember when Freddie was up on stage wearing them, fr one of them fringe leather jackets, looking like a cowboy saying, I just cut this record with, with Huey down in uh, Houston. He sang before the next teardrop well, fall. I don't remember that. There's a bunch of hippies. They didn't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> Ain't nobody believe it's going to be a hit except me, I believe. Boy, that, that well, thing that broke out. <laughs> but I thought it was going to be a monster. I just, and I couldn't get nobody to believe me, man. I borrowed the money. I was broke. Went to New York, tried to shop, and they sent me back home broke, and, and nobody wanted it. Well, you're a, uh, a local Gulf Coast producer. How'd you get even this oddball Freddie Fender record to get picked up by a major label? I put it out on my own. Nobody wanted it. Yeah. I went and borrowed the money from a bank uh, in, in Houston, borrowed five grand, went to New York, tried to chop it. Nobody wanted it. It, t it said I was crazy, like all my other We're talking records. about before the next teardrop falls. That's exactly right? what yeah. I'm talking about. And, and I turned around and went and got some credit here in San Antonio, the pressing plant. And I pressed it on my own label because I still believed there was a damn hit. And I wouldn't take everybody in Nashville said it wasn't. And uh, so that I went and put out my own crazy Cajun label and got in my old van. That some bitch was barely making it. I'm telling you, I was busted. And I went out and the radio station brought it around myself and got airplay on it. And it became one of the biggest records. The orders were so big out of Houston, out of Dallas, that the record companies refused to believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, because. It was a new market. The Spanish people was buying it, and the country people were buying it. And the orders were like tripling what orders would be. 38,000 in Houston they wanted, 40,000 in Dallas. And, and I tell these guys, come pick this record up for me. I said, shit, you ain't sold that many. I said, look, man, come on down here and count. That's all you got to do. Like, they made them believe I had that many orders. You know, they didn't believe it. They refused to believe it. Did, uh well, that, that, that Spanish recitation in the middle of it must have been a big factor in them not wanting to take it. No, I, you know what I think is it just it, they didn't, Freddie wasn't the best looking guy on earth, and I loved him, they still do, but he, he uh, uh, they just didn't believe that that was right. He had a blues voice that was singing country music, and, and, uh, and they refused to believe that that feeling would go country. Mm -hmm. But it, it was something different. It was fresh, and, and like ever in our business, we need something fresh every so many years, because we all run in the corner sooner or later, you know. What, but it was different. 
Well, Freddie's the greatest. I saw him, what was that movie he was just in? The Milagro Beanfield yeah. War? Yeah, yeah. And that's the last thing I helped put together for him. He didn't show up in the last half of that. <laughs> Because <laughs> I was watching that movie, I said, hey, He's a good actor, too. I saw, who's that cool guy that looks like Freddie Fender? You know? oh, he's a good actor, man. Freddie's a very good actor, man. If you'd run across that borders, man, Tom Freddie did all his life, he'd be a good actor, too. I <laughs> <laughs> had to tell the man, uh, what do you got? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. So you got some acts right now. Uh, Jim, what are you up to these days? Well, I got just got a... Uh, Gun Bunnies record out. Gun Bunnies? And, yeah. Where are they from? They're from Little Rock. That's where yeah. I'm, I was born, actually. In, uh, it's on Virgin. Yeah. And they got a Dice Rip Rock record that's just about to come out. No, they're out of uh, Mammoth. They're out of New Orleans. New Orleans, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wanted to cut down for a long time. They're good boys. And uh, don't know what's happening next. I got another Mojo Nixon record I'm about to start on next month. Mojo with a band. The world's ready for that. Yeah, that ought to be something. Yeah. Interesting, Mojo, too. Mojo's cool. Yeah. I like him a lot. Let's see, I got covered just about everything. I wanted to ask you, though, about uh, the Sun Connection. You were on Sun, but you were in Memphis during the uh, the heyday of the Sun oh, yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah. What, well, it was seeing them, like, I don't know, you hear people say that they saw Elvis and it inspired them. Well, I, I, I personally, I don't believe that, because when I saw Elvis in 56, twice, in the it was inhuman. There was no way you could see that and think that you could do what he was doing. It was undoable. Mm -hmm. But when I saw Billy Lee <laughs> Riley or Sonny Burgess, you know, I saw them, I thought, well, hell, I could do that. <laughs> so maybe I, you know, this other thing. No, but this, you know, it's a whole different. Yeah, Man, and and uh, the, when, when I was hearing those records in Memphis in the 50s, I assumed everybody was hearing the records, you know. Uh -huh. It wasn't until I came here to college, actually, that I figured out I had heard this music that was really unique. You know, I figured those, well, Dewey Phillips, the disc jockey who played all that stuff, who first played Elvis, he would say it's a hit and play the record, and I figured he was telling the truth that it was a yeah. hit, you yeah. know. And, uh, but no, Memphis was really a happening place. Well, I, guess, yeah. I guess this is the only guy on this panel that saw Billy Lee Rowley and the gr Little Green Men oh, yeah. and Sonny Burgess in the 50s. Oh, yeah. uh, was this unusually wild? I, I don't understand the... Not the psychology, but the sociology of it. I mean, these guys all seem like they're insane. It was racial collision. It <laughs> yeah. was racial collision, you know. pure and simple. And it takes a redneck to really play black music to make that happen, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, it happened other places, but I think it happened bigger and stronger in Memphis than anywhere else. Well, what was with Memphis? The water or something? Everybody was crazy People, been, there. people I mean. been coming there to record since the early 30s. There is something about it. Knox Phillips thinks it's in the air. I don't know. I think it's <laughs> geographic. <laughs> How's he doing, all right? He made it. He put in a new board. Can you believe oh, that, Oh, yeah. Man? I believe that. I believe the anything. Phillips, the Phillips man. Brothers put in a state-of-the-art recording console. It's amazing. In what, what location? In the, the Phillips place, not the, not the tourist the, trap. The, the, yeah. you know. <laughs> tourist trap. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> I'm, I'm, like I say, I'm interested in the sociology of that period. because what? Well, the world was changing right so, then. Yeah. Like Sonny Burgess. I mean, I can't imagine. I hear these records. They're most insane He was from Arkansas. Like, He's still like that. Uh, now, what's so that? Did he have his hair dyed like bright red or did something? Did you see him with there? bright red hair? Did no. Because uh -uh. I heard about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard that story, but I don't know that that's... Now, what's the song? Went to the river, took my baby to town. We want to do nothing, just rock and roll. Oh, we want a boogie. We want a boogie. Yeah, the other side of a uh, red-headed woman, yeah. And those are two really nuts. Insane tracking. songs, now, yeah, with a, the trumpet you know, player. trumpet player? I want to know what that was. Sure, it's a trumpet, yeah. Because it sounded like a coronet or He had a band. That band played at the Silver Moon Club in Newport, Arkansas. They were the house band, and they were absolutely smoking. <laughs> this piano player was was just insane. Yeah. And what about having a trumpet in the middle of the record? He also says, I jumped in my flivver, took my baby yeah. to town. What flivver? What's he talking it's about? It's a Ford. I know that, but yeah. it's 1956. What's he talking about flivvers Well, for? you know, it was a hot rod. <laughs> it's the basis for I mean, he's using ride. the 20s expression. That's, yeah. that's what yeah. threw me when I heard it in the 70s for the first time. But it's, it's that you know, black genre thing. I mean, that's what he was trying to do, was a boogie. I mean, the, the idea of boogie in 1956 was, uh, you know, well, he wasn't know, talking about this. You know, we know about Jerry Lee sneaking into the, you know, the, the show, the black show, supposedly, and watching the piano player, and we know about Elvis doing that, too. Was everybody, was just Memphis just crawling with little white kids jumping into black places? It wasn't a whole lot of us, but there were a few. Yeah, it me was, too. There was, was a point where that's the only thing, only place you could get in underage, and if you, you know, knew a couple of black musicians, you could get in. And uh, yeah, then that, there was a place in West Memphis where the Marquis and all those guys learned to play called the Plantation Inn, where it was a white club, and you couldn't get in, but there was there was speakers in the parking lot and black bands, <laughs> and Phineas Newbern's father's band, and uh, a lot of the, the the stacks, quote unquote stacks, sound the two horns, trumpet and 
you know, just two horns, not a big horn section. It came from that band, the Largos, at the, at the Plantation Inn. Huh. I remember but, uh, in New Orleans, Sure, I mean, man, that was the thing to do, was to get next to black music. Yeah, I remember in New Orleans, we'd go over to Like It Like That over, you know, and, and jam after we get to the Cosmos, you know, and when being Joe Bear and all that reminded me that Joe Bear would always go across the track and got over there one night and it had a rate and locked all of us up, man, because it was <laughs> black and white, was mixed yeah. in the same black yeah. club. So they, got, and, they rated you for mixing? Sure. Oh, yeah. I used to, I used they to go the Freedom and, Riders back then was, was rough. I, they'd lock me in the bathroom <laughs> until right? the cops were gone. Yeah. Wow. Oh, you had <laughs> yeah. to. Yeah, you couldn't be seen yeah. in a black club. And I love black music so much. It's unreal, man. And um, everywhere I'd go, every time I went to turn around, I got locked up. Well, you're the only real Cajun I've had on the show, so i got to ask you about one song that's been bugging me for years. I don't understand Pine Grove Blues. That was Nathan Absher. Nathan Absher. Yeah. Now, here's a guy, a white, very cracker-looking guy from Louisiana, singing about my negress. Yeah. Now, how could he do that? I don't understand. Well, my negress in French, it, it was it wasn't a bad saying. You it take wasn't a, bad. I mean, no, no, like no. He, 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 my negress. It was it, it's kind of like my tutu. It was it was a uh, endur endurement term, the way it's used in really? French. Really? Yeah. Sure Negress? Is. Yeah. Wow. Hey, my negress. You take coucher as soir. You know, it sounds to me like a guy singing to a black girl, which no, doesn't make any no. sense. No, but he, you know, a guy would, you know, you know, a guy sometimes you say that uh, to, to one of your buddies, they said that some, but it didn't mean nothing about it. It was just like a term of endurement thing, the way he said it. Huh. Well, back when you were a little kid in Louisiana, I mean, you couldn't, I mean, then you were talking about the 40s, I guess, you, you couldn't really get into the black things then, could you? Well, the, the way I got into it, that I loved so much, because, we used to uh, own a cotton farm, and we'd pick cotton and, and hoe cotton. Me and my dad, and we'd plant rice, and we had four shotgun houses, little shotgun houses, that there was two black families that lived in and two white families. Mm -hmm. And uh, my daddy didn't like the blacks at all. My mother's like me, she lo loved everybody. And, but I loved, I could hear the black people sing in the cotton fields all day, and I couldn't understand why I couldn't go listen to their music. I loved their music when they sang where they pick cotton. But my daddy wouldn't let me go. He'd tell me they would hurt you, they were bad, they would hurt you. But I would go set out at night on, on Saturday nights when they'd pick on, on the on the back porch, you know, get together and pick the blues. And I'd sit out there in the, in the pasture in the dark where they couldn't see me and the mosquitoes eating me plumb up, man. Because <laughs> I loved it so much, you know. Because I wanted to be close to it and, and my daddy would tell me, don't do that. And I couldn't, it, it really screwed my head up because I couldn't understand why we could be friends all day long in the field and pick cottons together and why I couldn't be friends with them inside the night to listen to their music, you know. And it was, uh, you know, it did a number on your head for a long time. But mm -hmm. I liked it so much that I didn't really care. So did you go to blues shows? I mean, well, I was too little then. I was so when you were old, when you guy. got bigger. Did you oh go? yeah, man. I mean, I tell you, for a while I thought I was black, man, because <laughs> I love black music so much. So who'd you see in, in some of these clubs down? Oh, every, everybody, Lightning Slim, Lazy Lester, was all raised together down in the swamp. You know, and first time I ever heard a black guy sing in Kentucky. Kentucky, you're this which is Kentucky, right? Down, down to heaven to me. Oh, yeah. I sat down there with Laser Lester with a fifth of T Bird Wine one time, J.D. Miller's thing. There wasn't nobody but me and him. And he went to playing and singing country music and blew me away. Man, I didn't, I didn't think there was a black guy could sing country music in them days. And was this uh, like acoustic blues or were there places with big speakers? That were no, electric? there wasn't no big speakers. You couldn't afford speakers in them days, man. Shit. Little speakers. Uh, I'll never loud forget. Shows. I had a guy come out in my, my barber shop one day. He come in there and had him on them amplifiers about that wide, you know, and, and he had a, 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 a piece of aluminum that's kind of like ice cream cone. And he had it, he had dropped his microphone, there'd been a microphone in there and had a wire going through his guitar, head on top of his guitar. <laughs> so he could sing through it and then would go through the amp at the same time. Wow. I, I thought that's hot stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> so it come a long way, but look at that. But that's the way things got invented, you know, guys made made do and, and, and people would see it and then they'd go modified, you know, that's probably why you got all the new things you got today. Huey, I remember you told me early on how, how you got that great echo sound before they had echo chambers when you oh, was recording. The, the one with the, uh, either one of them was with the barbecue pit, that <laughs> one was, was with, the, with that piece of steel, square steel thing I got out of the oil field. Is that the Wait, one you talking about? you put it in an oil drum? 
Yeah, it was. I didn't have no money. That's, BJ, I'm so lonesome I could cry his voice is over that. Doug Summers, too. Now, what about Jive and Gene, though? How did you get that sound on his voice? In the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had a toilet in the corner of the room. We recorded. They had two mics. So we had in them days. I'd put Gene in, in, the, in the toilet, and it was... And it would give me just enough room echo in the voice to, to give the echo. And that's the only way to separate it. I had one of them big old ribbon mics. You'd put it up on the stand and you'd, you'd lay your amps in the way you would, because uh, mono. And you would back up this amp or back this up until that's the way you tuned it up, the way you could hear everything. What else do you and need? Put your singer in, in the shitter, man, and, and let it go. <laughs> that was your separation, you know. Sound is good or better than the records they're making nowadays. I believe it, man. <laughs> well, you had to get them in them days. They wouldn't know we're going to overdub and we're going to remix and post production, right, yeah. brother? You, well, that's what you they stayed call there, you got it that night, man, and you didn't get it. It's they call ambience now. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember. the singer in the bathroom. That's I remember when he was doing Gene Allison's on uh, Gene You Allison. Can Make It If You Try. Yeah. And we got the final cut, and, and we'd been cut for hours because he'd get mighty drunk, my boy. And, <laughs> and he fell off the stool, <laughs> off the piano, and it, it had to be the cut because it was over. <laughs> he fell flat off of it, man. We got that cut, and he passed out. That Wait a second, it. so is that on the record? Can I hear him tumbling on the record? Or? I don't know if you can or not, man. I don't remember. Is that <laughs> ACA? Clear. I remember that. That's the way my replacement's mm -hmm. record was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, were you doing black people early because you were down in... When he first did Well, it. let me tell you what, I tried a couple of country records, guys that bring in their band down there. And then I would work in my barber shop and I would take off Mondays and I would go sell my records. I had a little post office box looking thing in my in my trunk. I'd put my records in there. Yeah. So I'd go make the record shops on Monday and I'd take my money and, and replenish what I had. But I couldn't I had airplay like crazy and and couldn't I wasn't selling any records. And uh, so that I couldn't figure out what, how come I was getting all this airplay. It was number one on the radio station. I hadn't sold a damn record, you know. So I said, man, i got to find something else to do, man. So uh, I went over to Mama Bono's on, on one Saturday. And, uh, Mama Bono? Bono's in Portland. She's the one who got me in the record. She died two years ago. A nice old lady. Had a record shop where everybody gathered them. You know, got that stuff from me. And um, I'll never forget that there was a... a some boys that, that walked in there and had uh, $5, and they bought $1 worth of records, uh -huh. white boy. And this old mammy walked in there, and she had a bunch of little kids, little black kids, and, and, and took this, this handkerchief out of between the drugs and, and, uh, and, uh, and took it out, old sweated thing, had a $5 bill, all sweated and rolled in there, and bought five dollars worth of records, and that's when I said, "This kind of music I got to cut," <laughs> you know, because their boy spent the whole five dollars, <laughs> where the white boy spent one dollar. You know, I said, "I'm in the wrong business. I went to cut black music. <laughs> I went to making money." <laughs> but that's how this one, this how I learned. It's the truth. So that was so that you did to make a change over to some black artists because I think you're based. Yeah, in terms Big of white Sambo artists. came in there. Big Sambo. Yeah, yeah Big Sambo. In the house did, records. Yeah, in the Big house Sambo. records. Did the first bird in the range game. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, what I talk about, I have that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but it, it's <laughs> you know, Sambo. or I would cut a, a white act. That's why I got to. I love black music. I would cut a white act song in black. Like driving jeans sounded like Fast Domino, Joe Bird did too, you know. Uh -huh. And they were white guys, but they sounded black. And so that I would, I guess, fall in the middle there somewhere, you know. But you, you don't set out to do these things. Jim, to tell you, some of this stuff happens when you, when you, when you crossbreed things, man, it's like making gumbo. You put a little pinch of this in it, a little pinch of that, and a pinch of that, and then you stir it up and cook it, man. You might hit it, you know, <laughs> but you don't know, and you can't tell what you started out to build until you've tasted it and see if you got it right, you know. And that's where it was then, just, uh, I knew if I could, uh, I knew if I could make black records with white guys at the time, they would, that that, that people in Louisiana and the South always liked black music, uh -huh. you know. But they never had white guys singing them till later in the years, and they would buy it. And then you got, then the black people went to buy the, the white boys singing the record too. Well, you were you were you started recording after Sun had kind of faded, right? I guess I, mean, I was in 58, 59. Right, so you're on the tail end of something. So mm -hmm. you weren't taking stuff up to Sam Phillips and trying to no. get it. No. Mm -hmm. 
No, the pe I wasn't taking nothing anywhere. People were taking my records and put their name on it, and I didn't have no money. I was hitchhiking down the highway and cutting hair and watching my ex on the American Bandstand. They never got a damn dime, man. <laughs> <laughs> Shit is very simple, but. <laughs> so that's the way it was, man. All right. So I learned how to make money with it, you know, but it took me a long time, about eight million subs before I learned that I was supposed to have a Cadillac for that. So <laughs> <laughs> waiting for mine. <laughs> All right, well, listen, it's been a real pleasure having you on. Hope no, I see I'm, you out in L.A. sometime soon. Oh, I'll be over there. I got some acts. I got my little boy, Ben. You know, he's nine now. And I got me, finally got me a governor that's going to take care of him starting April the 1st. And then I'm ready to start chopping my product. Now, and I've got a couple more acts to cut. I'm very happy with what I come off with. Well, it's always a pleasure to see you. I hope I see you out no, there. Same here. All you all, too, man. And uh, keep the music running. Without music, you ain't got nothing. You know that, don't you? <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Mike. Same here, buddy. Thanks, Joe. Our pleasure. Little Lars from Austin signing off. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah.